Okay, so now that we've talked about changes in supply and supply curves and demand curves and elasticity and all of this stuff, um, we can talk about some practical applications of, of these principles of firms and markets. Um, specifically, this idea of market power and what this means um, if you're a business and what this actually means if you are a regulator or a government who cares about market competitiveness. Um, so to introduce this, we're going to look, um, we're going to quickly review what firms actually care about. If you are a private company, if you're the chief financial officer for your company, you care about maximizing your profits. You want to get the most amount of profit. And to do that, you want to set your marginal cost to your marginal revenue. And if you can find where those things cross and create the right quantity of stuff, where it makes it so your marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue, you're going to make the most amount of money you want that to happen. Um, in the market, to figure out the best quantity of stuff to make, you want to find where the demand curve meets the marginal cost curve or where demand meets supply. And so that's going to be some prevailing market price that exists in the world and it will tell you the best quantity of stuff to make. And then that quantity feeds into your profit because that like the quantity that you sell determines your revenue. The more stuff you sell, the more revenue you bring in. Um, but then it also costs money to make stuff. And so you want to kind of optimize this here where you're finding a good mix of, of the cost of things and the revenue you bring in with things. So in perfect competition, the demand curve is the same. Like you want to be able to set demand equal to your marginal cost, equal to marginal revenue, equal to price. All of those things in a perfectly competitive market are going to be the same thing and that's everybody's going to be happy and that's where you're going to make the most profit and the most revenue and everybody's great. Um, but in real life, that's not actually what firms face. So we talked about this briefly at the beginning of this, um, this section here, where if you are in the market, all of the, so this, this supply line right here is the costs, the marginal costs of all of the different firms in this market, everybody combined. And that meets consumer demand at some point. And so in this example here, there's 50 things being supplied at $10 each. Um, and that's what we have in this market. But if you are an individual firm, you don't actually get to set that price um, on your own. You are stuck with whatever price exists in the world here. Um, if you raise the price on your own to like $20, you're not going to sell anything. Nobody's willing to really, uh, some people are willing to pay, but not a lot of people are willing to pay at $20. So if you set the price here, for instance, you'd get some people, but not a lot. If you set the price down here, you'd get lots of people, but you would run out of stuff. And so what you're really stuck at is $10. So the demand curve you face as an individual firm is flat. It's not this downward sloping thing. It's just this flat demand curve. And that's where you're stuck. So if you want to maximize um, revenue or maximize your profit, what you want to do is set a price that makes it so that you get lots of revenue that matches your marginal cost. But if, you, if your marginal, if the ideal price for you to maximize your profit is something like $12, but you have to charge 10, then that stinks for you. Um, you're not going to make as much money as you could if the price was slightly higher. And so you're actually going to make lower profits um, because the price that exists in the world is lower. Um, it could also go kind of in a negative direction here where let's say it costs like $30 for you to make one of these things to sell. Um, and you would love to be able to sell it for like $31 or make a little bit of profit off of it. But the prevailing market price is 10 bucks. Um, and so if you're spending $30 to make this thing, but you can only sell it for 10, you're not going to want to make the thing because you're not going to make any money on it. And that's not great. Um, and you have no power to raise that price up to 35 or to 31 or to anything above your cost of making the thing. And so you're not going to be able to actually work in that market. You're not going to be able to sell anything there. Um, and so if you're a firm, you're kind of stuck in this price taking world. You have to take whatever exists in the market. In general, firm decisions don't really have an impact on the price of a good. Um, if you are a hamburger restaurant and you know that um, like McDonald's sells their uh, McDoubles for like $2 um, and you make your competitor, make a, a competitor hamburger that's just like the McDouble, 
you could raise your price to like three dollars and nobody's gonna buy it because they're just gonna buy the McDonald's one. You could lower your price to 150 in hopes that McDonald's will also change their price down, but they're not really going to. Um, your individual firm decisions aren't really gonna change the market price. The market price is just gonna be the way it is. Um, it will change if there's any structural things, like if there's any change in like the price of beef in general, that will lower or raise prices for hamburgers. But you making a decision as a single manager in one company, you can't really do anything to affect the price. And you're basically stuck with the price. Um, you can have some markup on the price um, based on how elastic people are and how many other companies there are in the area. Um, in more advanced economics classes, there's actually ways to figure out the ideal markup. You can figure out the range of allowable markup. Um, I don't care about that for this class. We're not going to cover any of that. But just know that you can like raise the prices a little bit, but that's not going to affect the whole market. That's not going to affect the prevailing price. Um, but if you could, would you want to affect the price? If you could change the price from a $2 hamburger to a $1.50 hamburger or a $5 hamburger, would you want to do that? And the answer is yes, um, because of costs. So if you can set the price of the thing that you're selling to your marginal cost, then you get to mar maximize your profit. So if we go back to the example where I said like the prevailing price for something is $10, but it costs you $30 to make the thing, and that's your marginal cost. It costs you $30 to make each new thing. Um, you would love to set the price of that up to like $30 or to $31 or to $35 or something to, to maximize your profit. You don't want it stuck down at 10 because you're not gonna be able to sell much and you're not going to um, recoup those costs. So if you could raise that price up to your marginal cost, that would be ideal. You would love that as a firm. And so that is kind of the goal of all of these firms is if you want to maximize your profit and not just rely on the prevailing market price, you want to be able to move that price up and down. But that's really hard to do. So the way you escape the price taking world where the price just exists is you have to create something called market power. And this idea of market power means it's basically the ability to influence market prices. Um, it's the ability to make it so that the price of a McDouble is $2. And if you want it to be $3 nationwide and have all hamburgers be slightly more expensive, you have the ability to do that. Um, McDonald's has significant market power. And if they decide to double the price of their hamburgers, um, they could and they could potentially make it so that Wendy's and Burger King also follow suit. And then suddenly everybody goes up um, because of the market power that McDonald's can exert. Or you can go the other way. If McDonald's decides to make it so their McDouble only costs $1, um, then Wendy's and Burger King are going to have to follow suit and lower it as well. But that's because McDonald's has so much market power, they're able to do that. Um, this is the reason why you get an MBA. Um, the whole purpose of being really good at business management is so that you can escape the price-taking world and so that you can exert more market power. Um, the whole reason you advertise, um, the whole reason you streamline your production and your supply chains is so that you can influence the market and influence the prices of things so that you can maximize your profit and be better at selling stuff. Um, that's the whole point of, again, like being really good at business is really just a way to help you escape the, uh, the, the price taking world. So there's a whole bunch of different ways to escape existing prices and be able to have market power. And we'll talk about each of these in turn here. Um, so I'll list them all here and then we'll talk about them individually. Um, you can use price discrimination. Um, you can become a monopoly. That's a really good way of escaping market power because, or gaining market power and escaping price taking because then you can set the price to whatever you want. This is why people like to be monopolies. And this is also why public policy says, no, don't be a monopoly um, because it's not good for consumers. Um, you can impose switching costs and that makes it so you have market power. You can brand and differentiate and get involved in marketing. Um, you can have you can exert more control over your inputs and your costs or the most 
the most interesting way of, of gaining market power um, for our purposes is companies can actually use government regulation to increase their own market power. They can essentially weaponize the government and weaponize regulations um, to hurt their competitors. And um, we already saw an example of this with the peanut butter um, wars. Um, where you had Jif and Skippy fighting each other for different peanut butter regulations on purpose so that they could undercut their, their competitors by making it so that their competitor was no longer considered peanut butter. Um, they were able to use government regulations to kind of improve their own market position and market power. So we'll talk about some other examples of that in a minute. So price discrimination here. Um, this is an example of kind of an economics term that sounds bad, because um, we talk about discrimination a lot in, in the context of like racial discrimination or gender discrimination. We don't like discrimination. Um, in the instance of price discrimination, it's not actually like necessarily bad. Um, all it really means is that you can sell things to people for different prices. Um, if you have perfect information about people, instead of selling things to people at kind of a prevailing market price, if you can read their minds and figure out how much they're willing to pay for something, then you can charge them that willingness to pay, and then they'll pay for it. So if you can set the price to willingness to pay, then that's great for you. Um, and this is why I had you listen to the podcast about Uber and why it's kind of an economist's dream. Um, because Uber and Lyft and these other kind of ride sharing things or meal delivery um, systems like DoorDash, they're really good at um, looking at people's preferences. And if you've ever taken an Uber during rush hour, you'll notice that the price is like twice as expensive as, as normal. Or if you take an Uber from an airport or from a train station, it's more expensive. And that's because you're you're more willing to pay to leave an airport than you are um, just trying to go from one place in downtown to another place in downtown. Um, so your willingness to pay is higher. And as a result, they can charge you more. Um, or if you're trying to get home from a New Year's party, um, they can like triple the, the price for an Uber because they know that people are kind of desperate to get home. People are more willing to pay more money for that. And so they take advantage of that. And so that's this, this instance of price discrimination. Um, airplane tickets, this is another good example of this. Um, none of you, if you ever go on a flight, um, if you talk to all your neighbors and ask them how much they paid for the ticket, nobody pays the same amount for anything. Um, and that's because airlines are really good at price discrimination. Um, if you buy a ticket for a flight a year in advance, um, it's going to be a lot cheaper than if you buy a ticket for the next day. And that's because they know that you're willing to pay a lot more to be able to fly the next day. If you have like an emergency flight or something, or if you are working for a really rich business and they're fine with you booking your flights the day before, they know that those types of people are willing to pay a higher price. And so they charge them a higher price. For the people who buy tickets a year in advance, they know that they're not willing to pay as much, and so they lower their prices for those specific people. Um, and so you get all sorts of different prices instead of one general price um, because of price discrimination. Um, another example of this is um, Amazon is actually really good at this too. One of the reasons they are so big and so wealthy is because um, they have all sorts of data about your um, purchasing habits and your spending habits. Um, and so what they can do is they can give you personalized prices for things based on your past purchasing, purchasing history, based on your location, based on what time you look at their website. Um, a whole host of things um, influences the price that you see. Um, often, if you are logged in using your Amazon account and you see a price of something, um, you can log in as somebody else's account or use like an incognito window and you might see a different price. And that's, it might be more expensive, it might be cheaper. It's because they try to tailor their prices of things for you specifically in your specific profile um, because they're trying to boost their profits. They're trying to raise the prices um, to a point where it matches your willingness to pay. They're essentially trying to take away your bonus points um, or your surplus. So if we look at this graph here, for instance, this is what we've been looking at before, um, where you get the bonus points, where you're willing to spend like $15 for a book, you only have to spend $8, and so you get um, $7 in bonus points, and that's great for you. You feel great about that deal. The purpose of price discrimination is 
if you know that this person is willing to spend $15 for a book, then you sell them a book for $15. And if you know this person is only willing to spend $5 for a book, you can sell them a book for $5. Um, you can sell this one person a book for $10. Or this one person who really doesn't care about price at all, you can sell them the book for $20 and that's great for you. So essentially, this lets you take this producer surplus and push it all the way up to here so the producer is getting all sorts of bonus points because they're selling to everybody at their exact willingness to pay. The only way this works is if you can read people's minds and know their exact willingness to pay, which is hard, or if you can kind of guess their willingness, which is what um, airlines do um, by changing um, the price depending on the timing of your flight. Um, they're assuming that people who are buying flight tickets the night before, they're willing to pay a lot for that. And so they charge a lot more because of that. Um, so that's that's one way to gain market power is instead of charging this this exact price here that exists out in the world instead you um, just charge whatever people are willing to pay if you can figure it out um, another way of gaining market power one of the most popular ways and what most companies would love to be able to do and what governments try to prevent companies from doing is to create monopoly and the reason this works is um, if you can create a monopoly, by definition, that means the entire market for the thing that you're selling is only one firm. And so suddenly the market demand is the firm's demand. Um, and so instead of being a price taker, um, you're the only company that's, that's selling something. And so you can set the price to whatever you want um, because you have that power now. You're no longer taking prices. And so what happens with monopolies is they will produce less at a higher price than firms in competitive markets. Um, and this creates deadweight loss just like taxes. Um, and so we can actually look at this graphically here. Um, so there's an example of this on the resources page. Um, if you go there, there's a video where I walk through how to do this um, and how to calculate it using actual equations. But if we, if we don't look at the equations right now, let's just walk through the, the logic of, of this. Um, so we have this blue line is the marginal cost or just the supply line. Um, the red line here is the marginal is the demand or marginal benefit. So in theory, um, what this company should be charging is this market price right here where demand and supply meet. So there should be 12 ish books for twenty six dollars is what that looks like. That's what the price should be. Um, if this was a competitive market, that's what the price should be. But if you're only a single firm that has total control over this market, your rule for maximizing profit is not to set um, price equal to marginal cost, it's to set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. So you're not looking at like overall demand, you are looking at your marginal revenue, um, which is different and it's actually lower. Um, this green line here is the marginal revenue you get. It's not demand. It's your own costs inside the firm and how much stuff you're, or not, the, not your own costs. It's what you're getting from selling to people. Um, and so this is actually um, lower than the red line. And what this means is if you want to maximize your profit, you should actually be making at point A here. You should be making far fewer things. So instead of before you were making like 13 books or 13 whatever we're making here, now you should only be making 10 if you want to max, maximize your profits and you should be charging $20 for it. And so that's cheaper than what is happening out in the real world. The actual equilibrium here says there should be 12, 13-ish things for $26. But if this company wants to maximize its profit, it needs to only produce 10, but they're going to be cheaper. So that seems like it's a good deal for consumers. The issue, though, is that if there are only 10 things out in the world, um, consumers are willing to pay more for that. If you look at the demand curve here, a consumer is willing to pay $30 for 10 things there, which means this company, even though to maximize their profits, they only have to charge $20, they can charge $30 for that um, because people are willing to pay that price. 
So what you end up getting is this thing that I like to call the monopoly triangle, where this is the, the price that should exist in a competitive market. Um, because they're a monopoly, they actually maximize their profit by making less stuff and charging less, but they don't have to charge less because people are willing to pay more for the reduced quantity, and so they'll actually charge more. So that's what makes this triangle. This is the ideal point. They don't have to make as much, they don't have to charge as much, but they will charge more because people are willing to pay more. And so that creates this monopoly triangle. And if we fill in these different rectangles and triangles, we create um, a graph that looks similar to the um, tax graph that we've been looking at. Where consumer surplus here, that's the triangle, these are the good deal points that people are getting, that has been reduced. It used to be from this point over, it used to be this triangle, but suddenly all of this is gone. Consumers aren't getting those good point or those bonus points anymore. Um, producers, on the other hand, when we talked about taxes, this rectangle here was all of the benefits, um, all of the surplus that was taken from producers and consumers and then transferred to the government. Under a monopoly, that doesn't go to the government, that actually all goes to the producer um, because they can charge, again, like people at this point, they should be selling at 20 because they're not making as much stuff, but they can charge up to 30 because that's what people are willing to pay. And so all of this extra surplus from the producers or from the consumers is going to the um, producer and that's great for them. They love that. Um, that's why you want to be a monopolist because then you get all that extra money. Um, but it also creates deadweight loss, just like taxes. This triangle right here, let's erase it. This triangle right here, that is all deadweight loss. Um, so somebody who was willing to pay $27 for something no longer can. They're priced out of the market because now the price is $30 instead of whatever it was here. So they're not actually buying anything and that's a loss of efficiency. And so monopolies are not efficient. Um, they cause all sorts of deadweight loss just like taxes. Monopolies result in fewer things being sold at higher prices because people are willing to pay higher prices for fewer things. And so this is why governments typically don't like monopolies. Um, it's worse for consumers. You have to pay more for less stuff. Um, and it, you don't like it, you feel bad. Um, that deadweight loss is actually like noticeable. Um, if you have a company that is a monopoly, for instance, um, internet providers typically act as monopolies. Um, Time Warner and AT&T and Comcast. Um, there was an investigative journalist report from a few years ago that showed that they basically carved out the country and allocated specific counties to specific companies and said, like, this is where Comcast can work. This is where AT&T can work. Here, this is where Time Warner can work. Don't encroach on each other's counties. That's kind of where you are. And so as a result, these companies can... Um, reduce the amount of stuff that they provide. Um, so there's been this, this trend over the past few years to impose um, bandwidth caps and to raise the price of internet access and to reduce the amount of internet access that you can get. And that is because they can provide less and they can charge more for it. And so the price of internet can go up because it's no longer competitive. Um, and so you can actually feel this, like if you ever call Comcast tech support or AT&T tech support and you have to wait for hours on hold, that is actually the deadweight loss that you're feeling. That's kind of the negative side effects of having monopoly. It, it, it's not great. It's not economically efficient and it doesn't feel good. Um, and that's the deadweight loss in, like, in real life there. So governments don't like monopolies because of that. Um, Sometimes, though, governments do like monopolies, and there's a specific instance of monopoly where it's okay. Um, and it's what we call a natural monopoly. So natural monopoly is a big, expensive thing that costs a lot of money up front and then has low marginal costs. Um, and in these situations, it's generally more efficient to just have one firm deal with it. Um, a good example of this is like the water system in a city. Um, there's typically just one company or one organization that deals with water in a city or deals with electricity in a city or natural gas or other things like that. 
Um, and that's because like, if you're in Atlanta and you want to create a, a competitor to um, Georgia Power, that means you basically have to lay your own power lines. You have to go dig up um, all of like dig trenches in all of the streets and wire things to people's houses. And you have to create your own uh, power plants and you have to create your own overhead lines and you have to do all of that on your own. Um, and then people can start using your electricity. But that is crazy expensive at the beginning to do that. Then adding one additional person to the electrical grid the marginal cost of doing that is incredibly low. It's not like it's more, like it, it does kind of add a little bit more um, to the cost of, of providing electricity, but it's super, super tiny. Um, and so in that situation, it's more efficient to just have one organization, one firm, one governmental unit, one something, do all of the upfront costs and do all of the digging and the putting overhead lines and all of that stuff and then just allow them to be a monopoly and they provide those services. Um, we see this also um, with water systems. Again, if you want to have a competitor to Atlanta sewage, then you have to build your own sewage tunnels and good luck doing that. Um, we also see this with public transportation. If you want to create a competitor to MARTA, for example, um, you would have to dig your own subway tunnels and then um, basically create your own public transportation system on your own and then compete with MARTA. And the cost of adding one additional rider on a MARTA train is like zero. It's, it's very cheap to add more riders. And so the benefit that you're going to get, like you're never going to like recoup those costs over time um, because adding more and more people and advertising your system um, isn't going to get you tons of money. And so as a result, you get this natural monopoly system. It's more efficient to just have one organization deal with MARTA, have one organization deal with utilities. Um, and so these are kind of the, the, the prototypical examples of a natural monopoly here is utilities and public transportation, these big expensive things that are then cheap to have people use after. Um, so what this looks like graphically is this. You have some demand for public transportation, for instance. If we say this is like rides on MARTA, 30 million rides a year or something. Um, notice how the marginal cost curve here is different. It is flat. Or if it's not flat, it might be a little bit higher. What that means is like adding one additional rider onto a MARTA train or adding one additional house to the water system or to the electrical grid or to the sewage system doesn't really cost much at all and it doesn't get more expensive over time. And so what you end up with is this is the socially optimal point. You should have lots of people using this system for fairly cheap, um, $10 a month for a MARTA pass or something. Um, but if you're a monopoly, you get to do the whole monopoly triangle thing that we've been talking about, where this is the socially optimal thing. But if you want to maximize profit, that means you need to set um, your amount or the, the price and the quantity that you provide where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, which means you're going to set the price down there, a quantity down here. So you should be providing 30 ride, 30 MARTA rides or whatever. Um, but you're only going to be doing like 15 here because that's going to maximize your profit. But because um, you're under providing, people are willing to pay more. Um, so even though it'd be great to only pay like $10 for this thing, um, people are willing to pay like $25 for that. And so you're going to end up charging more for less. And so we create the monopoly triangle. This is the ideal level. Um, we're going to provide less and we're going to charge more. And so suddenly it is really expensive to pay for utilities or really expensive to have internet or really expensive to use public transportation. And we don't want that um, because the government kind of allowed this firm to be in charge of, of the monopoly. And so they end up overcharging and under providing. So one way to fix this is to actually use the monopoly triangle, but kind of in your favor. Um, so if we extend this further, this is the same monopoly triangle we had before where it should be this amount. They're providing like to maximize profit, they're going to under provide and they're going to overcharge. But 
if the government subsidizes them and gives this company a ton of money, what they're going to end up doing is um, they can. This is where they're going to maximize their their um, profit because they're suddenly getting a whole bunch of subsidies from the government. So they should be providing this level, but then they're going to overcharge. Um, and they're going to overcharge at point C, which is the socially optimal level. So in order to get the natural monopoly to be at the right level, the government needs to subsidize them to the point where when they overcharge because they're a monopoly, they're going to overcharge to the correct level. Um, so it's a way of, of kind of using that monopoly triangle idea in your, in your favor and making it so they're hitting the right level and the right price. You just have to pay them a bunch of money to get them at that level. And that's how natural monopolies work. Okay, a few final ways of, of dealing with market power and making it so that you can have more. Um, if you can make it harder for consumers to switch away from you, then you can raise prices. Um, if you can lock people into your product, and this is more of the MBA world. This is this doesn't have to do with like creating a monopoly or getting government subsidies or anything like that. This is more of just making it so that people don't want to leave your thing. And so this is more like product design things. Um, airlines are really good at this, um, where they create all sorts of like reward programs and they give you preferred status. So if you want to get like a silver level, platinum level, whatever on Delta, then you need to fly on Delta Airlines all the time to be able to get the points so that you can then use their fancy lounge and, and get food on airplanes or whatever. And so once you're locked into their ecosystem, they can start charging you slightly higher prices and you're okay with that because you want to maintain your status and you don't want to switch away to a different airline and so you're kind of locked in. Um, so if you can get benefits that are exclusive to that brand, then you can charge more as that brand. You also have technology constraints. This is um, something that uh, Apple and Microsoft are both really good at. Um, they make it so that like you're basically, if you're buying Apple products, um, when you buy an app on the App Store, you can use it on all of your iOS devices. And so if you have an iPad and an iPhone, you get to use all of the stuff that you purchase on both of those things. Um, if you ever want to switch away to a Microsoft tablet, you have to repurchase all of your software. And you don't want to do that because that's more expensive. And so it's expensive to switch away. And so you're basically locked into Microsoft's world or to the Android world with Google or to Apple's world with iPhones. Um, and then because of that, Apple and Microsoft and Google can start ch charging you higher prices because they it's too expensive and too big of a hassle to leave and so you're kind of locked in um, search costs make it hard to switch away um, where if you can make it really complicated for people to to switch away um, they won't um, we see this with like health insurance plans um, when you graduate and go on to get a job or if you already have a real job that has benefits um, one thing that you have to decide is what insurance plan you want to use and that is like super hard. Um, I was not expecting that when I got my job here. Um, I finally had health insurance, it was super exciting. Um, but then they gave me this like 50 page booklet of all of the different plans. And I had to choose between like dozens of different plans and to make it easier, they simplified it into like three. Um, and they said, choose one of these. And I was like, oh, okay. and I just chose like the middle one, I think. Um, I have no idea if that's the best plan. I didn't spend all of the time searching out for that, and so maybe it's more expensive. It probably is, um, but I, it's too expensive to, to spend the time to do that. And so by ex like that's insurance companies exerting market power um, and making it so that I pay potentially more just because it's too complicated. Um, and so they can lock you into this. Um, another way to impose switching costs is um, going back to this network idea. Um, Again, if you want to create like a competitor to Facebook, good luck because you're going to have to get like a billion people to switch to your platform. Um, occasionally you'll see these things pop up or somebody will make like an open source version of Twitter and they'll try to get everybody to jump on board because um, it's more principled than Twitter or whatever. And nobody moves because everybody's kind of locked in. It's too costly to move away from the existing thing and nobody's going to do it. And so as a result, um, Twitter is free, but if you're with something else where you have kind of this network cost idea, it's really hard to move away. And then 
the existing network you're in. It, again, this is similar to the technology constraints. If you're in Apple's ecosystem, they can start raising prices on you and you're just gonna suck it up because it's too expensive to move away. And that gives them market power. Um, branding and differentiation also gives you lots of market power. This is the whole reason marketing exists. If you can make your stuff non-substitutable, then people will not want to move away from it. Um, so you essentially have to create um, kind of a demand for it. Um, so this is the whole purpose of advertising, um, to make it so that your thing is super important and nobody wants to move away from it. And big companies do this all the time. This is why like, when there are like Olympics or the World Cup or huge sporting events, the main sponsors are things like McDonald's and Coca-Cola and Burger King and these huge companies, which at first glance feels weird because why do you need to advertise McDonald's? Everybody knows about McDonald's. We don't need to see more ads for McDonald's or for Coca-Cola. We're here in Atlanta. Coke World is just down the street from, um, from GSU here. Um, why, do you, why does Coke World even need to exist? It's basically a giant advertising museum. Um, but the whole purpose is because they have to continue advertising to build up the demand for their services so they can continue to have lots of market power. Um, Coke exerts tons of market power. Um, they can change prices of things for the whole market of soft drinks. McDonald's can change the whole market for um, fast food um, if they decide to. Um, because they have the ability to do that. If they were just a single restaurant that sold hamburgers and they decided to raise their prices a little bit, that's not gonna change the market. But if McDonald's decides to double its prices or raise its prices a little bit, everybody's gonna follow suit because they have the ability to do that because they've spent so much money on advertising and building this huge global brand and differentiating themselves as kind of the main hamburger supplier of the world. Um, brand loyalty, this is another way to, to kind of build this, this um, differentiation, makes it so your stuff is non-substitutable. If you love McDonald's fries because they're the best or whatever, um, everybody's going to be super loyal to your fries and they're not going to want to switch away. And so if you double your price of fries, you're still going to live with them because you can't not eat McDonald's fries and because you're super loyal to the brand. Um, so basically, if people are stuck with you, you can charge them more. Um, and that gives you more market power and the ability to raise prices. The exact amount that you can raise um, the prices depends on how elastic people are. Um, it depends on the overall elasticity. Again, in a more advanced microeconomics class, you'd actually be able to calculate the exact markup for each individual consumer based on their preferences and based on indifference curves and other things like that. We're not worrying about that for this class. We're just saying that you can, depending on how elastic people are, you can change the markup. Basically, if people are very, very elastic, you can't raise the price very much because then they'll run away. If people are very inelastic, then you can raise the price a lot because they're not gonna run away. They're gonna stick with you. Um, a couple other final things that you can do to gain market power. You can um, impose cost and input controls. If you can make it so it's cheaper for you to make stuff, then that allows you to um, either deal with lower prices or be able to change, um, like you can raise the prices because it's cheaper for you to make stuff. Um, some examples of this that happen in the world is if you can own the whole supply chain or the whole means of production, um, then you have a lot more control over the prices. So if you can control inputs or if you can control supply chains, um, you cut out all sorts of middlemen companies and makes it, you make it so that you can provide cheaper goods um, and you make more profit. Um, lots of companies do this. Um, famously, Saudi Aramco in the 1930s, um, they're kind of the main oil company in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, they made a deal with the Saudi a monarchy back um, pre-World War II um, to be able to have like total control over the region um, and all the oil reserves, which meant, which means they basically have total control over the entire supply chain of oil production. Um, all of the pipelines, all of the refineries, all of the drilling equipment, everything is theirs. And so it's really cheap for them to, to kind of control all of that. They don't have to pay contractors. They don't have to 
buy certain inputs from things, they own the whole system. Um, and so they have a lot more control over the price. Apple has done similar things and other technology companies have done similar things where the whole iPhone production system, um, the iPhone is produced all over the world. Different parts of it are produced in South Korea and Germany and in California and in China. Um, and instead of contracting out with individual factories, um, Apple has engaged in this, this strategy of trying to basically build their own factories um, in all of these different countries to basically own the entire supply chain um, and make it cheaper for them to, to produce stuff, which then gives them more market power. Um, and then the final way of doing this, um, and the most interesting for our purposes, is this idea of using government regulation to enhance market power. So if you can use the government to stop other people from competing with you, then that's great for you. Um, and sometimes this is good, um, and sometimes this is not so good. So patents, the whole purpose of a patent um, and the patent system we have in the United States is it essentially gives an inventor a monopoly over the thing that they create. Um, intellectual property as well. If you write a song, you get copyright on it, and then you have a monopoly over that. You can charge whatever you want for it. You can give it out for free. You can do whatever you want with it. It's yours. Nobody else can use it. And so that allows you to have power over the thing that you create, um, which is great because then um, that encourages all sorts of innovation. People want to create more stuff and invent things because then they can get patents on them and then they can profit from them and then those patents expire. And we like that. Um, where this gets tricky, though, is it's hard to decide when patents and copyright terms should end. Um, originally, um, copyright lasted like the life of the creator plus some number of years. It, it's changed over time, sometimes 20 years after the author died, sometimes 30 years after the author died. It's different all over the world. Different countries have different requirements. Um, but what companies have been doing over the past few decades, um, especially Disney, they've led this charge, is they've um, used government regulation to extend the duration of copyright for even longer. Um, in the 70s, there was a push by Disney to extend copyright um, for the life of the creator plus like 70 years. And so as a result, uh, um, lots of culture and lots of like intellectual property from the early 1900s has been locked out of kind of the public domain for decades. Um, just at the beginning of this year, um, is the first time new works have entered into the public domain, old books from like the 30s. Um, if you go to Project Gutenberg, it's a collection of a whole bunch of different open or um, public domain books. Um, you can download them for free. You can put them on your Kindle. You can typeset them and print them. You can do whatever you want with them because they're just in the public domain now. Um, it had been a long time since other since new things were added to there because um, be lobbying from Disney made it so that the duration of copyright lasted even longer. And that was in part because they were worried about their own intellectual property, um, where lots of early Disney movies like uh, Steamboat Willie or like Dumbo and Snow White and Sleeping Beauty, um, they were at risk of, of having their copyrights expire, which then meant that they would become public domain and anybody could make their own Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck or Sleeping Beauty based on the same animation style as the original Sleeping Beauty. And that was a threat to their business model. And so they used government regulation to extend copyright for a really, really, really long time. Um, which then had all sorts of downstream effects that were bad. And so how do you determine when to, to allow for copyright to expire or not? I don't know. Um, it's tricky. And so, yeah, like this, this is a, a huge debate in the intellectual property copyright world. There's no right answer that people have found. Um, Disney has found other ways of getting around this. There um, are some reports that lots of these live action remakes that Disney's been making over the past decade um, are in part a way to like extend copyright for those things. Um, for, so like Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast and The Lion King and all of these things from the 90s, um, there's suddenly live versions of them, but it's because they're trying to in part extend copyright for them so they can hold on to those brands without losing them. Um, that's also why like the Mickey Mouse 
clubhouse TV show exists and all of these other things. They have to keep using their intellectual property from the 1930s when they first started doing this so that they can still claim intellectual property today. Um, so it's, it's tricky. Um, another thing that companies will do um, is they'll use licensing requirements to limit access to markets. Um, you see this specifically with like um, one of the most common examples is um, hair salons. In order to get a license to um, cut hair or be an aesthetician or a hairstylist, you have to go through a licensing process. You have to go through all sorts of um, courses. Um, you have to get a specific business license and you have to renew it. Um, and it's not necessarily because styling hair is inherently more dangerous than other jobs. Um, uh, there are more chemicals used and there are situations where it could be more dangerous. Um, but lots of these licensing requirements that have been imposed have been from the hair salon industry as a way to protect existing um, salonists so that they can keep prices higher and not have tons of competitors. Um, the New York taxi system works the same way. There's a limited number of taxi medallions that exist, and in order to drive one of the yellow cabs in New York City, you have to have a medallion. And so that prevents lots and lots and lots of taxis from driving, and that keeps the cost of riding in a taxi higher. Um, if you could flood the market with taxis, which is what Uber essentially did, um, that would drive the price of, of taxi rides down. And so the taxi industry wants to keep that up. And so there's all sorts of licensing requirements um, where in order to drive one of their officially sanctioned taxis, you have to have a medallion that proves that you are a taxi driver and those cost lots of money to get. Um, and that is a, a purposeful strategy for limiting access to the market and increasing the market power of, of the taxi industry. Um, you also have prohibition of competition. Um, where sometimes companies will try to use the law to make it so that um, their employees can't go work for other competitors. There was a scandal a few years ago in Silicon Valley where um, if you worked for Apple, for instance, and then you left, um, you had to sign a non-disclosure agreement and a non-compete agreement that made it so that you could not work for Google or for Microsoft or for Amazon or for any of the main um, big technology corporations. And it wasn't just Apple, it was everybody. They kind of had these non-compete clauses and so that made it so Apple could not poach people from Microsoft and Microsoft couldn't poach people from Google or from Amazon. Um, and they used the legal system to enforce this. Um, they actually had like legally signed non-disclosure and non-compete agreements that were backed by law and they had all sorts of contracts. Um, and the whole reason for that was to limit competition and limit the spread of trade secrets and limit other things um, so that these companies could maintain their market power and maintain power over prices and um, be able to maximize profits. Um, and so these are all fascinating examples of government being used as basically a weapon um, in price competition. Um, again, the peanut butter story that you listened to a few, se a few sessions ago is another excellent example of this, of just uh, private companies using the government um, to gain or lose market power. So it's, it's something to be aware of if you work in the public sector. Um, pay attention to when um, lobbying organizations for industries are purposely asking for more regulation. Um, because generally it's, it's their strategy to gain more money and more market power. And so it's something you need to be aware of.